and good evening from Maryville. What is the difference between a subjective science and an objective science? <laughs> the difference is <laughs> that a subjective science should not be made objective, and an objective science should not be made subjective. We'll go with the easier understanding. An objective science has a place in the world, but not a subjective place. What we study in high school and university, what we study in our professions, that is different than who we are, that is different than the spirit. And a subjective science should not be made objective. Where I keep all that I'm learning about me and the spirit and I objectify it. I externalize this. Where I still think Bhagavan's darshan is seeing Bhagavan with a form and name outside of me, instead of understanding and appreciating, Bhagavan's darshan is inside of me as my form and name. And we experience this through our Bhagavad Gita course. It's a rebalancing of the subjective science, the objective science. How in chapters 7 through 12, Bhagavan goes deeper and deeper into us, taking the simple message that you are divine, but making us feel this. In chapter 7, know the divine. Chapter 8, remember the divine. Chapter 9, feel the divine. Chapter 10, see the divine. Chapter 11, it's not about seeing the divine, it's about envisioning the divine. In chapter 12, which is Bhakti Yoga, depend on the divine. In chapter 13, we focus on the Aikya between Jiva and Jagadishwara, the oneness between the created and the creator. And when that oneness is manifest, that's called Brahman. So we often hear Jiva, Brahma, Aikya, but you have to go through Jagadishwara or Bhagavan. The terms that are used in chapter 13 is, there's a difference between Kshetra and Kshetragnya, the known and the knower. And if you know there has to be a knower there, is the water bottle the knower? Is your skin the knower? You know your thoughts, so the thoughts can't be the knower. You are the knower. This anubhuti, this is not experienced because of lack of clarity. Even as I'm sharing this, despite 53 classes in our Bhagavad Gita course, it's still externalized. It's still a theory. An important part of chapter 13 is where Bhagavan Krishna shares with Prince Arjuna what jnana is. He says jnana is values. This is one of the most beautiful portions of Srimad Bhagavad Gita. How Bhagavan is saying, if you have values, you have jnana. See how he's not objectifying jnana. He is subjectifying jnana. The deeper you are, you come to appreciate this. And I shared with all of you that the meaning of jnana is not even knowledge. It is that which makes you quieter. And the more quiet the mind becomes, this becomes a catalyst to the intellect becoming still. Quiet mind, still intellect. Then you can start to dissect the known and the knower. With kshetra, kshetra gnya, but without 
values. Without stillness, such viveka is not possible. Now, some may be thinking, what values? Everything you want other people to be, that's a value. <laughs> True? <laughs> Anything you want someone else to be, that is a value that we should be understanding intellectually and feeling in our day-to-day -day affairs. In chapter 14, Bhagavan Krishna, throughout Bhagavad Gita, he's reading Prince Arjuna's mind. And he is sharing with Prince Arjuna, you want to know where these virtues and these vices come from, don't you? You want to know the source of why this person has virtues and this person has vices. And the answer for that is gunas. Gunas are ropes. Ropes that pull us up, virtues. Ropes that push us down, vices. Our virtues and vices are based on our gunas. That is our blueprint. A solid blueprint, that building can be built high. A weak blueprint, people don't know where to, where to lay the carpet. Making this even more tactile. We have three gunas. We're predominantly one, though we all have three gunas. Tamas, or laziness, is low thinking and low living. A lazy person thinks in a low way and they act in a low way. Rajas, or aggression, is low thinking, high living. <laughs> they still think low, but they live high because they believe pleasure. Possession, position, will bring them peace. But they don't have the thinking to bring them peace. Yes? And sattva, which is quietude. That is simple or low living. I'm sorry. That is high thinking and the living doesn't matter. I want to be clear about that. Someone who's engaged in sattva, in this quietude, they have high thinking. And it does not matter how they live. If they have low living, it's, their high thinking makes that beautiful. If they have high living, their thinking makes that manageable. So to focus on being one who's engaged in high thinking, tamas and rajas don't provide that, that doesn't Encourage that. In chapter 14, Bhagavan is sharing, if you're aware of your gunas, then you can change. But if you're not aware of your gunas, you can't change. I'm trying to be more fit, so I recently calculated my body mass index. And this was the first time that I calculated it. And in my awareness, I realized that I have to change. I'm too healthy. <laughs> but truly speaking, that I realize that I need to balance my body mass index more so I can change. But if I'm not aware of this, I can't change. And in chapter 14, Bhagavan says, once you've changed, then you can transcend. Once you're aware of your gunas, you can change your gunas. Once you change your gunas, you finally have to transcend your gunas. And you can't go from tamas to sattva. I have to change tamas to rajas to sattva and then transcend sattva. Chapter 15. Chapter 15 is known as a shastra. A shastra is a message that has two parts or two factors. One is a shastra is good for us. So that which encourages goodness or dharma, that's one part of a shastra. The second part of a shastra is comprehensiveness. Comprehensiveness. If I tell you, be a good person, 
That's not a shastra because I'm not being comprehensive in how to be a good person. And chapter 15 is known as a shastra because goodness is encouraged in a comprehensive way. This is why in Chinmay Mission we have a, a fondness for chapter 15. This is a summary of all of Srimad Bhagavad Gita. Chapter 15. In chapter 15 we study the absolute and the relative. Looked at differently, we study the creator and creation. Looked at differently, we study remembrance, that is vidya, and forgetfulness, that is avidya. All of this is covered in chapter 15. And there's a powerful image with which chapter 15 begins of a ashwaha. Shwaha means tomorrow. Ashwaha means not tomorrow. The relative creation, forgetfulness, will not be there tomorrow. So why are you losing yourself in that which is relative, in the created, in maya? Bhagavan says you have to use the shastra to cut down this ashwaha. And what is that shastra? Viveka. To know what is important, what's not important, to know what is real and what is not real. Without Viveka, there will always be a dependency on the relative, created, Maya. Near the completion of chapter 15, Bhagavan talks about sannyasa. And he says, nyasa is resigning. And some is embracing. If one has deeply engaged in discrimination, they resign from that which is not important, that which is not them. The language of the Upanishads, neti, na iti, na iti. And in letting go, it becomes natural to hold on. Some. Some is to embrace the absolute, the creator, knowledge, who I am. That's what sannyasa is. Knowing what you're not and knowing what you are. And when you know what you're not and you know what you are, your investment changes. We can give to the multiverse resources, time, and energy. And when we know that's not important, this is not real, you change your investment. All of your actions, kshara, are directed towards that which is beyond actions, akshara. And if your actions are not leading you to rest, to realization, then they're not actions. And with this, the new teachings of Srimad Bhagavad Gita is completed. But there's still three more chapters. Chapter 1 is the introduction to Srimad Bhagavad Gita. Chapter 2, the table of contents. Chapter 3 through 14, the content. Chapter 15, summary. Chapter 16 through 18 is the appendix. Now that's all a technicality. How does this feel? We began Srimad Bhagavad Gita focusing on, not that we want to do this, but focusing on sakama, selfishness. Then Bhagavan began his teachings, and what is his teaching? Nishkama, which is selflessness. And the more nishkama is present, the more shuddhi is present, or purity. Where there is shuddhi, there is pramana, or authority, knowledge becomes authoritative. And I talked about that, having clarity, leading to conviction, leading to confidence. And where there's pramana, finally what comes about is tyaga, a letting go of the known, 
and a natural holding on of the no word. This full system Bhagavan calls as Daivi Sampati. This is the description of one who is divine. These are the qualities of the Devas and simply put, oneness. The Devi Sampati is where you feel a oneness with this and that. And Bhagavan takes the opposite perspective to teach us the importance of the Devi Sampati. He shares the Asuri, and it's hard to say Sampati because it still means inner wealth, but I guess the inner wealth of someone who's an Asura is they're not focused on oneness, they're focused on their own gain. Now all we know about Asuras is from stories and serials. But if you look around, starting with the person in the mirror, starting with the person looking at you and talking to you through Zoom, <laughs> there's lots of us who only look out for our gain, correct? <coughs> Leaders, corporations, countries, and worse than that, and it's hard to imagine that there is any worse being than that. But <coughs> the Rakshasi Sampati, the blueprint of a Rakshasa, they're not even interested in their gain. They're only interested in your loss. <laughs> not interested in their well-being. As long as your life is miserable, that is their wealth. <laughs> so Bhagavan brings both of these up. And he completes chapter 16 sharing how you are today is going to determine your tomorrow. How you live in this lifetime is going to be how you're going to live in the next lifetime. So to have this fantasy that I'm going to be an asura in this lifetime, but my next lifetime I will be a devata, Bhagavan saying, you're deluded. <laughs> Steady, go back to chapter one. <laughs> more rinsing, more repeating required. Chapter 16 focuses on Swabhava. Naturally, then, chapter 17 focuses on Shraddha. 16 is Swabhava. How I am. 17 is how I am is expressed through Shraddha or faith. And naturally, Bhagavan is saying, Shraddha goes out, Shraddha goes in. If you want to be more faithful. If you want to have more peaceful faith, sattvic shraddha, you need to invoke that through the right inputs. When you're around people who are materialistic, superficial, mean, it starts to affect your shraddha. When you're around people who have the most amazing stories about, about how they live Vedanta, then that raises your shraddha, that I can do that too. So Bhagavan describes this. He says our shraddha should be directed to yantra, tantra, and mantra. Yantra is equipment, tantra is technique, and really that's not so relevant. The focus is on mantra or purpose. Your swabhava, who you are, expressed as shraddha, should be directed to purpose, mantra. And Bhagavan gives more detail here. Your mantra should be to live for yajna. What does yajna mean? Dedicated. If checked off, next is tapa, which is investing. If checked off, What's next? Dana or sharing. If your purpose is yajna, there will be tapa, there will be dana. If what you're doing is being one who is dedicating, 
there will be more investing in yourself and more sharing with others. Isn't that selflessness? What Bhagavan shared in chapter 2, 3, 4, 5. In chapter 17, which is a larger chapter, Bhagavan defines sattvic, rajasic, and tamasic yajna, tapadana. And very simply put, sattva is selflessness, rajas is selfishness, and tamas is self-harm. Self-harm. When you harm someone else, you're naturally harming yourself, isn't it? And this study brings us to chapter 18, which is the largest chapter of Sriman Bhagavad Gita. There's a forward table of contents, which is chapter 2. This is a backwards, a review of contents in chapter 18. In chapter 18, Prince Arjuna begins with the question, how do I let go? He is sensitive enough, honest enough to know that he's holding on to the known. He's holding on to what is not a priority. He's holding on to that which is not real. And he's having difficulty letting this go. He knows how to do it theoretically. Bhagavan, help me. Let go. Bhagavan Krishna says, engage in tyaga. Let go of, and we have these strange notions of tyaga of cell phones. If we didn't have a cell phone, we wouldn't have class right now. <laughs> tyaga of airplanes. How will you see your grandparents if they live somewhere else? Tyaga of income. How will you pay the taxes on the income you earned this year? It is Tyaga of Raga. Tyaga of Raga. That's a cool hip-hop song, you know? The Tyaga of Raga. <laughs> raga means attachment. Raga means dependency. Don't depend on your cell phone. Imagine we shouldn't depend on cell phones. <laughs> Don't depend on your family. Don't depend on this body. Tyaga of Raga. And this sounds esoteric, but Bhagavan says this is possible if you have clarity of what karma is, clarity of what action is. And he shares that there's five components to action. And I know you're all ready to write this down. We studied this for hours. <laughs> There are five components to action. Fine. Then Bhagavan magnifies this more. He says there are five components to action, but the deeper aspect of this is the why. And he brings up the need to be clear about the vision behind your karma, the purpose behind your karma the attitude with which you're engaged in karma, the understanding with which you're engaged in karma, and the commitment to karma. I recently had a satsang in Chicago, and the talk was, the hardest working people I know. And I asked everyone to envision who the 10 hardest working people they know are. Out of 100 people, two people had their hand up as having their names on their list. <laughs> Only two. Ideally, everyone should have had their name on their own list. And we tend to only focus on the hard work, like a robot, like a Tesla. It's a hard working machine. But you have to understand we are humans with egos. Don't focus on the hard work. Focus on the, how are they hard working? Because they are humble, because they are happy. The happiest people are the most humble people, are the hardest working people. That's what Bhagavan is emphasizing here. Bring in more humility. You are not 
the doer. You are not the deserver. You are not the equipment. You are not the doer. You have no part in this. Just work for me. Bhagavan. This is when we invoke Kripa. Remember the Kripas we talked about? My Atma Kripa, my self-effort, brings to me Acharya Kripa, a guide to me. My guide brings to me Shastra Kripa, the scriptures to me. Shastra Kripa brings to me Ishvara Kripa, or the grace of God. And so Bhagavan finally shares, Prince Arjuna, you are free. How are you free? free? He says, Ma Shuchaha. Do not be sad. And here, it's not so much as he's instructing Prince Arjuna as he's projecting what Prince Arjuna is like. One who is not sad. Sanjaya completes Bhagavad Gita by sharing Bhagavan Krishna is Jnana, Prince Arjuna is Dharma, and when Jnana and Dharma are present together, there is Kritanta or rest, freedom. Bhagavan Krishna is vision. Prince Arjuna is lifestyle. And when vision and lifestyle come together, there is rest, there is freedom. 